like for you to turn in your Bibles with me this morning back to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This will be the 10th message in the series, Christ and His Sheep. And I've actually started titling them. <laughs> this title for this one this morning is quite unusual. And I guarantee you it wouldn't surprise me if Sermon Audio doesn't question me on the title of it. I know that uh, Jim Casey's told me down at... Uh, uh, Eager Avenue before they've had sermons rejected for the title of them. I might have to change it back to Christ and his, his Sheep Part 10. But I've entitled this message, You Are Not My Sheep. You Are Not My Sheep. What a title. What a thought. It's scriptural. And we're going to talk about it this morning. You know, as sinners saved by the almighty grace of God, justified and redeemed through Christ's accomplished work of redemption, as our surety and our representative and our redeemer and our savior, one of the things that you and I need more than anything else is we need a, need a very clear understanding of our relationship to the Lord and of our actual position in union with the Lord Jesus Christ, our great shepherd, because it's one of the most comforting truths that we have in the Word of God. You think about it. As he is, so are we in this world. This isn't something that I'm waiting to attain out there when I close my eyes in death someday in the future. It's not something that I'm hoping to attain if I maintain enough or I preach long enough or I become moral enough or I become holy enough, whatever men want to define that as. But I need to know, where, what's my state? I think you ought to ask yourself that question this morning. How does this God, this God who will by no means clear the guilty, who will not overlook the least of sin and the best of men, how does that God view you this morning? How does he see you? And you think, oh, I know me. Well, he does too. How does he view you? Think about this. Our Lord's already said this. I am the good shepherd. And I, lo I know, I love my sheep. And I'm loved of my sheep. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for who? The sheep, those that I love and those that love me. And we know this, we love him, why? Well, I just decided one day I wanted to accept Jesus as your person, my personal Lord and Savior. That ain't what it's about. We love him because he first loved us. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I, I must bring. And thank God, if he, if, when he says, I must bring them, they're coming. And I'm telling you, if there's one sheep that's his that he fails to bring, all of us are doomed. That's how critical this is. They shall hear my voice, and there shall be one foe and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. This is the commandment that I have received from who? My Father. I, that's good news to me this morning, isn't it? To you? I, it's good news to any person who truly sees themselves as a sinner. Do you see yourself as a sinner this morning? That's what's wrong with this religious world. They're, they've committed a few sinful acts. They might have broken God's law occasionally. But they're still not, they don't see them. Listen, God justifies the ungodly. Doesn't mean you got to be the worst. And I'm, and I'm not implicating for you to go out of here talking like this. We are just filthy, no good, worthless black dogs that God would be just and fit and proper and putting every one of us into hell. I know that. I've had people tell me, well, I know I was saved because I know God would be just to put me in hell. That's not salvation. 
Salvation, you know what salvation is? It's knowing that in spite of the fact that God would be just in putting me in eternal condemnation, giving me exactly what I deserve, that in the person of Christ, what has He done? He has set me free from that totally and completely and eternally. That's what salvation is. It's knowing a God that can be just and not overlook my sin. I don't want God pretending that I'm something that I'm not. I want God to see me as I am in Christ. Holy. Accepted. Listen. Here's how my God sees me this morning. Unreprovable. You hear that? Unreprovable in His sight. Holy. Oh, I know you, Richard. Yeah, I do too. But God says, Unto Him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his throne, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his. That's the confidence I've got this morning. People say, you can't be that sure. Yes, you can. It, because listen, it doesn't rely on me. It relies on him who cannot lie. That promised me eternal life before the world began. I believe him and his faithfulness. Don't trust me as far as I can throw me. But him I trust completely. At all times. Good times or bad. And I still doubt and feel with uncertainty. And he reproves me. But he always drives me back to the same thing. To him who loved me and gave himself for me. Who laid down his life to set me free. So that message is good news to you and me. Who see ourselves as sinners. But to those who don't consider themselves sinners or to those who do not see themselves as sinners, the same message that is comfort and encouragement and peace to you and me, you know what it is to them? It's confusion and controversy and contradiction. This was the words we left off with last week. There was a division among the Jews for these sayings. That's where we want to pick up. There, there's a couple of questions. And it, as I sat down, you know, writing a message is just, it's, it's a weird thing the way it, the way it works. Well, the way you start, you know, because I, I always start off with one thing about preaching verse by verse. I kind of know where I'm going, and I know what I'm going to cover. But I, I sat there for a long time with the computer just blinking, trying to get the first words out. And, and a question came to my mind. And when the when the question comes to my mind, it's a verse. The next thing I do, I get my concordance out and find the verse. Sometimes I have to Google it to find it. That's a good thing about Google. Now, if you can think of any semblance of a verse you're looking for, you Google it and it'll come up. But there were a couple of questions asked by Job's miserable comforters over there in the book of Job that show the condition of these moral, religious, self-righteous, lost Jews that our Lord Jesus Christ they were divided over his sayings. And the question that the miserable comforter presented to Job was this. Can thou by searching find out God? Can thou find out the Almighty under perfection? In other words, can you, can you figure him out? Can you take it and you search out everything and know everything? Now remember, we, we, when we, when, like I've told you in the past, any question... In the Bible, from the Old Testament or the New, that can be answered with a yes or no, how's it always answered? It's in the negative. So the question in the end is this Canst thou by searching find out God? What's the answer? No. Can you arrive? Can you, can you attain? Because that, that fragment, can thou find out, find out the Almighty under perfection, it, it literally means can you attain to the perfection that God demands. That's what, it, that's what that verse literally translates me. Can you, by your efforts, can you attain the perfection of the Almighty? Can you do that? What's well, the answer to that question? Not on your life. No. This phrase, canst thou by searching in the original, it, it, it's one Hebrew word, and it means a search or an investigation or an inquiry. Our Lord Jesus Christ had told these Jews on another occasion, had he not, search the scriptures. Literally, you do search them. 
For in searching the scriptures, what do you think you've got? you got life. And they, the scriptures that you're searching through all the time, thinking you're digging out all these little trinkets that's so good for you, they testify of what? Everything. Moses, the Psalms, the prophets, the epistles, the revelations. They all testify of who? They testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Now if you'll notice, folks, in these verses that our Lord Jesus Christ had spoke in verses 19 through 24 where he kept telling them, my sheep hear my voice. You know, everybody that came before me, thieves and robbers. He kept pointing out the distinctions that separated him and distinguished and defined him from every other false Christ and every other false prophet. If you'll notice, the division was not caused by the miracles our Lord Jesus Christ performed. The division wasn't caused, listen, it wasn't caused by our Lord Jesus Christ's character and conduct. It was not caused by the way our Lord Jesus Christ wore his hair or the way he dressed. What caused the division? What, is, what does it tell us? It says the, the, there was a division, therefore, again, because of these sayings. That word sayings, in the original, it means a word or a speech which embodies a concept or an idea. What does that sound like? Huh? A speech or a word that embodies a concept or an idea. What are we talking about here? We're talking about a doctrine. They're troubled over what? They're divided over what? Over his doctrine. Over what our Lord Jesus Christ taught. It's amazing how natural human reasoning worked when it comes to the person and office of the Lord Jesus Christ. These Jews, they had observed the Lord Jesus Christ. And by their observation of what they had seen and what they had heard with their physical ears and with their human reasoning, half of them said what? He got a devil. The other half, using the same human reasoning principles, same human concepts, same human logics. What did they come up with? They said, can somebody that can heal and restore sight to somebody that's been blind their whole life, they couldn't possibly be demon-possessed. Two different human reasonings, two, different, two, two similar human logics looking at the same evidence come to two completely different conclusions. But here's the thing, even though these religious groups, both of them, with their human reasoning and logic, could and did draw logical conclusions to what they observed, they couldn't come to the correct conclusion. Then came the Jews round about him, after they've done all this reasoning, and they said unto them, how long do you make us wait? Make us to doubt. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Think about that. These same sayings that had caused a division among these two different groups of Jews was the very same sayings by which our Lord had called out one of his sheep that's standing here hearing this same conversation. He was a man who had been blind from his birth. And our Lord used the same message that made these people come to the conclusion he's got a devil or he doesn't have a devil. This man sees in these same words what? This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. We'll read this in, at the end of this message because this is so important that you see that. What's that teach us? Two groups. One sinner sees Christ for who he is, bows to him, and worships him. The rest of them come to the conclusion He's got a devil. He doesn't have a devil. And then they question him, how long are you going to make us die? They've got the evidence already, don't they? Two things this teaches. First of all, eternal life, you know what it is? It's by divine revelation of Christ and his accomplished work as the God-sent Messiah. That I know to be true. 
You, if you believe the gospel this morning, you did not figure it out on your own. You didn't wise up. But here's the second thing it teaches. Salvation or eternal life can never be secured and it can never be obtained by human reasoning or intellect. See, that's what so many people have trouble with when they hear the gospel for the first time. Lost people. They always draw this conclusion, well, you're saying that we all got to be five-point Calvinists to be saved. Those of you that have been with me for the last 32 years, have you ever heard me insist that you got to be a Calvinist to be saved? Anybody ever heard me say that? One time? Go back. There's 600 messages on Sermon Audio from 2008. Go back and find me one place where I've said, if you don't believe the five points of Calvinism, you're lost. Because, folks, here's the long and the short of it. I believe the five points of Calvinism. You know what I was? Lost. I had it systemized and prioritized. Knew it and could debate it and argue it. Didn't know him. And I didn't. Listen to my Lord. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. And you revealed it unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of the Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And here's the kicker. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. It's got to be revealed. See, it's God the Holy Spirit that makes Christ known to God's people. Think about what Paul said to those at Corinth, where I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus Christ accursed. I would say by that calling Jesus Christ accursed, couldn't you say that kind of fit part of those people into that category that's standing here and said, this guy's got a what? A devil. Imagine that. The eternal Son of God, Emmanuel, a bunch of rabble-rousing, good-for-nothing dirt, clods of dirt, calling this person a demoniac. Boy, boy, the pride of humanity. And that no man can say Jesus is Lord, but how? But by the Holy Spirit. Nobody can own him as their owner master, but by the Holy Spirit. See, the consequence of this divine teaching or revelation, it always results in the same thing. The regeneration and conversion of God's sheep in time under the preaching of the gospel. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. It's written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard. The only way you can hear is what's got to happen. You've got to be taught. You've got to be given ears to hear. You've got to be given eyes to see. You've got to be given a heart, mind, and will to understand. Everyone that's heard, been taught of God, they've heard and they've learned of the Father. Learned it what? He's holy. He'll by no means clear the guilty. He will not overlook the least of sin and the best of men. What do they do? They come to Him. Come to him in what sense? Is the Redeemer? Is there Messiah? Is there surety? Is there substitute? Is there Savior? Is there mediator? Is there friend? <laughs> we come to him as our friend. What does the Holy Spirit teach those that are his? Calvinism? Arminianism? Election? I hear a lot about this in my day. People put a lot of emphasis on it. We believe in the sovereignty of God. So did Nebuchadnezzar. Our God is in the heavens. And whatsoever he's pleased to do, he does it among the armies of the heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand and none can say to this God, what are you doing? Nebuchadnezzar did not know the true and living God. Now, don't tell me you believe in the sovereignty of God. I say, big deal. I believe in election, bigger deal. Israel believed in election, physical Israel, didn't they? They were God's chosen people. 
What did that work out for him as a nation? So take your little platitudes and put them in your little pipe and smoke them. Because that's all they're worth. He does not teach Calvinism or Arminianism or election or sovereignty. Though Calvinism is truth and reality, that's not what it's about. What does he teach? What does the Holy Spirit reveal? I'll tell you what he reveals. He reveals the righteousness of God. I know that to be so. People say, well, y'all can't define the gospel. No, you can't. What's the gospel? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Pretty simple. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation. Remember we talked about last week, Christ said, I have power to, have power to lay it down. And I got power to take it up. And it's that same word, power, that's translated that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So what's the power of the gospel? The person it declares. His office, his his dignity, his worth, his value. What gives our Lord value and worth? The fact that he is Emmanuel, God with us, and he paid everything necessary to save his people and set them free. He says, it's the power of God unto salvation to every man that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, where? In the gospel is the righteousness of God Reveal. And I'm telling you, as God is my witness this morning, if a man, I ain't going to say a woman, I guess you can in our general, if a man or woman gets up and does not preach the righteousness of God, they have not preached the gospel, can you? I don't care what they talk about. They can talk about his blood all day long. Now they will, won't they? They talk about his love. I tell you, you can't understand the love of God apart from righteousness established. I, I, you know the problem with everybody that I know of that's Calvinist, Armenian? I, here's the problem with everyone. They don't know what's saved and lost to us. I, they need to go read Romans 10 and pray over it. The first four verses. And settle in their mind, by God's grace, what saved is and what lost is. It's pretty simplistic. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, my kinsmen according to the flesh, is that they might be saved. I'm pretty certain that if somebody is praying for somebody to be saved, what's the implication of that? Huh? They're lost. Right? Well, how do you know, Paul? Here we go. For they being ignorant of but one thing. What are they ignorant of? The five points of Calvinism? Perseverance of the saint, unconditional election, limited atonement. I knew all of them. There's a Bible somewhere near here shows that I knew every one of them. They being ignorant of the righteousness of God and the same thing always results in every self-righteous, unregenerate, lost sinner. When they're ignorant of God's righteousness, they're always going about to establish their own. And they're going to point to it somehow, some way. I have done this. I have accomplished that. I'm not what I used to be. Well, good for you. Seriously. That's the problem. We've we got to get away from these old ideas. These old false concepts that people we respected and loved and appreciated told us in ignorance and unbelief. See, Christ showed them and he showed us. He shows us the end of everybody who's not taught of God. Here's their end. Jesus answered, I told you. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. How long are you going to make us doubt? I told you. You believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness. They, they testify that I'm exactly who I say I am. But here's the, here's the thing. But you believe not. Why? 
because you're not my sheep. As I said unto you. What an indictment by the judge of all the earth against these moral, sincere, dedicated, religious, self-righteous sinners that stand here. That, that brings to my mind that passage I read to you there in Mark chapter 12 in the call to worship. He had all those concepts. He even admitted, Christ, you, you've said right according to the law. He admitted that, that, that obedience was not the end-all, be-all. But he was still what? Not far from the kingdom of heaven. But to be not far from the kingdom of heaven is to not be in the kingdom of heaven. But they demand, they're demanding, tell us. Christ didn't even bow to their demand. He just told them what? I've already told you. I've told you before and what? You didn't believe. You didn't believe. And I tell you, you keep this in mind. These Jews, they weren't asking Christ to tell them plainly so they could believe. That isn't what they were wanting. What were they asking him for? They were trying to, they, that's all their plan was about was entrapping our Lord. He's going to say something and we'll have him. Hey, listen to this. Same group, Jews. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in the act of adultery. And when they set her in his midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act of Moses in the law commanded us that she should be sown. What do you say? This they said, tempting him. They weren't concerned about the law. They weren't even concerned this woman had been caught in the act of adultery. <coughs> that they might have something to accuse our Lord with. That's all it was about. And it's the same thing here. These Jews had all the miracles. They had heard all the words. And they had evidence standing right there in their midst. One who had been blind from his birth. Who now can see everything. And yet... We're not going to believe. And Christ tells him, you heard my doctrine, you've seen the works, and everything that I've done testifies that I'm the Messiah. Now, he never denied it. But here's the thing. The problem wasn't with Christ's doctrine. And folks, the problem wasn't with the miracles he performed. They were real miracles. The problem was these, these reprobate Jews. That's what the problem is. But you believe not. Boy, this is what got me this week when I was studying it. But you believe not because you are not my sheep as I said unto you. Now let me state this as clearly as I possibly can. Because boy, this is, this is a hard pill for people to swallow. But it's the reality of the scriptures. These Jews that are standing here to whom our Lord speaks these words were not individuals who at some later point in time would come to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Or come to true repentance. By this statement of fact that our Lord Jesus Christ makes here, He reveals that these particular Jews, whoever these dudes are right here, they were vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. These guys, there was no hope for them. None. Our Lord Jesus Christ would not and he did not shed one drop of blood for these men of whom he makes his statement. He did establish for them a righteousness that secured and demanded their salvation. Not at all. They, listen, they weren't chosen of God and ordained to eternal life because if they had been chosen of our God and ordained to eternal life, they would have believed. How do we know that? As many as were ordained to eternal life, what do they do? They believe. This is what John Gill said on this particular part of this passage. He says, These not being the elect of God had not the faith of God's elect. Christ is the omniscient, all-seeing God, knew this, that they were not chosen of God, for he was present when the names of his elect were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Had they been his sheep, he would have known them. He's already said, I don't know you. For he knows all his sheep. And he calls all his sheep by name. 
Had they been given him by the Father, he would have known it and would have owned them as such. But so it was not, and therefore they were left to their own hardness and to their own belief. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, maybe some of them could actually come to believe later on. Or later on, they had revealed themselves as sheep. Now, you listen to me carefully. If Christ, if, if Christ, who is eternal and unchangeable, declares that somebody's not their sheep, they're not his sheep. Now, if I, if I made that statement, and... and Sinners have a tendency to do that. If it's just a mere man making that statement, if I made that statement, if I said, well, I don't think that person's a sheep. Well, I'm judging them as to be sheep or not sheep based on what? Something that I'm seeing either in them or not in them. But our Lord Jesus Christ, folks, when he makes this kind of a statement, it, this is Emmanuel. This is the one who had previously said in the verse right before this, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, I know that sort of thinking and this sort of thing makes some people uncomfortable, but I tell you what, the reality of the doctrine of reprobation, you know what it does? It confirms and teaches God's elect the eternal security that you and I have where? In the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why does God do it this way? Write this down. Write this verse down. You ought to read it. Every once in a while, you ought to just pick up your Bible and go read Romans chapter 9. In particular, you ought to read these verses. Listen to this. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Isn't he in suffering long with these wrath vessels? These rascals have brought a woman to him caught in an act of adultery, tried to trap him. They're out there now trying to get this guy that was formerly blind to admit that Christ is something that he is. And they tried to trick Christ. And our Lord tells them, I've told you. I've told you. Why did he do it? So long suffering with the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath before prepared, what? Under glory. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentile. Those for whom Christ came and lived and suffered and bled and died, those sheep are given eternal life. Those for whom Christ Jesus did not come, did not suffer, did not bleed, did not die, the ones for whom he did not offer himself as a ransom and a sin offering for the only thing awaits him is condemnation and death. The language that our Lord uses is similar to the language that he used with these Jews previously. He said to them, why do you not understand my speech? Because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. There's another group. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, you and I, we, 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 are children of wrath even as others, you and me, but there was never a point in the time that any of God's elect were children of the devil. We were lost sons and daughters of God. We, we were never children of the devil. Don't, you, can't, you can't prove that from this book. It's impossible. He goes on, he said, I say the truth. Why do you not believe me? He that is of God, what do they do? They hear God's words. You therefore hear them not. Why? You are not of God. But here's the, this next statement our Lord makes. Look at this and we'll quit. The next statement Christ makes confirms the reality of what I told you. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And my, my, no man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and Father, what are we? We're one. 
Yeah, we have an example of the reality of what our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching by this declaration of these men and these two groups of people that are standing there. You think about it. In one group, both of them, both groups hear the same exact words, don't they? They saw the same exact miracle. They're standing in front of the same exact person and they hear the same shepherd's voice. But you listen to this. One of them, this blind man, he hears the voice. He bows to the voice. And he worships the one who is the voice. Listen to you. Now we know, this is him standing before these same guys that are trying to trap our Lord. They're questioning this blind man that now he sees. He says, we know. Talking about wisdom. This is a guy that's been blind all his life. Probably uneducated. Probably not well read in anything. Because if you, Braille didn't get, wasn't in existence back then. If you, if you knew anything about reading, somebody had to read to you. But he stands before these scholars of the law and he said, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God, doeth his will... He hears him. Since the world began, it's not been heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. If this man were not a God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, listen, see, they get accusatory now. He's told them the truth. How they respond. Well, you know, that's right. No, what do they say? Thou wast altogether born in sins. Well, they were too. Weren't they? These guys that know the law don't even know the law. These guys that are scholars of the Psalms, they don't know what David wrote. David said, the, the wicked go forth from the womb doing what? Speaking lies. You born in sin, dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. We're done with you. Shut, and, and that happened to almost us. You've lost your mind. Get away. Thank God our Lord went and found him. The right person found him. Jesus heard that they'd cast him out. And I tell you what, Jesus being eternal God, he knew they'd cast him out. He had purposed that they cast him out. He, he said he came to bring his sheep out. He got him cast out. Heard that he's cast out and when he found him. Think about that. There's that sheep, that past shepherd looking for the sheep. When he found him, he says, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he? Here we go, remember? No man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Who is he, Lord, that I may believe on him? Jesus said to him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talks to you. I tell you what, I, one of the things that amazes me about our Lord is he, he speaks, he spoke with Moses like a man speaks with a friend face to face. And you know our Lord talks with us face to face out of his word. He's our friend. Do you realize that? We, we sing it every once in a while. What a friend we have in Jesus. Our Lord is our everlasting, eternal. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Isn't he? It's your friends talking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. These religious guys got all the books and all the wisdom and all the knowledge. They reject him. This poor, dumb, blind man that's been blind all his life. It's known nothing but beggary. He falls down and worships him. And our Lord speaks. He hears what Christ said. I'm going to tell you, this wasn't a sinner simply accepting Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. And then later on down the line, as he grew and matured, come to believe and figure out the five points of Calvinism. Leading him to a richer, fuller life. This was God-given faith that recognized and bowed to the living word that had declared to him 
the accomplishment of redemption through him laying down his life for the sheep. It's the substitute and surety of his people. This man had been taught of God. He had. The other group of sinners, these men that are asking all these questions, made up of moral, sincere, dedicated, religious, self-righteous fools, and that's all you can call them, had all the Old Testament scriptures. They heard with their physical ears. They saw with their physical eyes. But they had not been given spiritual ears and spiritual hearts and minds and understanding. And they could not hear. But here's why they could not hear. You are not my sheep. Now we'll come back next week and we'll pick up in verse 27 and we'll, 28. We'll talk about the sheep. My sheep hear my voice. Are you a sheep? See, that's the thing. Have you heard his voice? Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. I appreciate your presence. Lord bless you and keep you until we see you next Lord's Day. David, would you dismiss us, please?